as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another Quarantine TV edition of Real Fans, Real Talk. Of course, it's Trip Young, and, uh, and we got legend in two games, Eric Sanchez and Will Carucci from On The Board Sports in the building. What's going on, fellas? What's going on, man? I'm looking forward to another great episode. Absolutely, guys. Thank you for having me, and it's a pleasure talking sports with you guys. And just want to give a shout out to all the essential workers out there, whether or not you're a cop, fireman, EMT worker, grocery store worker, construction worker, you know, whoever you met, even a postal worker, who, whoever you are that's deemed essential, thank you for doing what you're doing. Absolutely. We definitely uh, appreciate all the work of the essential workers and also those that right now we're trying to contribute in any way, shape or form, whether it's helping out with meals, uh, helping out with the essential workers. I have family members who work in the childcare industry uh, who help in that way as well. So I had to offer to you guys. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We cannot stress that enough. And, you know, again, to anyone that's been affected as far as dealing with a loss, we send our condolences out to you. We ask that you guys continue to stay home, stay safe. If you are going outside, put your mask on, put your gloves on. And when you get back inside, make sure you wash your hands, wash your face, and just be safe. And uh, with that being said, we are going to jump into the biggest topic, and I guess the only <laughs> topic in sports right now, the uh, the Last Dance, the 10-part document documentary series, which features the uh, the, the, the the second three-peat of the Chicago Bulls with uh, Scottie Pippen, MJ Rodman, Phil Jackson, and all of those guys. So let's jump in. Yeah, and it's amazing. I'm, I'm glad you brought up that point, Will, um, with the Kobe scene. It was, it was sad um, to, you know, get the little snippet of him because I really wish we could have gotten Kobe right now to express his thoughts on that relationship. Um, and even as that episode unfolded, you know, the, the 98 All-Star game, as Mike is speaking to the other veterans in the locker room, he's taking jabs at Kobe, but you can tell he already has a certain level of respect for him. Right. Um, where he talks, about, he talks about, you know, the kid could be 0 for 4 and he's still looking to jack it up and he's going to bring it right to you. He's going to try to make it a one-on-one -on -one game. Like, those are all things he's saying from a, a place of respect and understanding that I was that young guy one time that wanted your respect, and I would bring it to you. And now I'm, I'm watching this 19-year-old kid who's willing to do the same thing. Definitely. That's, that's a fact. It's just it's so crazy that, you know, we, we lost Kobe a couple of months ago, and we still be, you know, paying homage to Kobe right now as the season, you know, progressed, if it wasn't for the coronavirus, it's kind of like, damn it, it, it just, it took away from us really being able to give Kobe his just due this season. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we get a, a conclusion to this NBA season. Um, but it, it was, it was amazing seeing Kobe and just, you know, I love seeing him paying that homage to Mike. And just, you know, letting the world know, you know what I'm saying, I'm here because of, of this man and the doors that he was able to, to open for us and how he changed the game. And, you know, the one player who was probably closest to Mike, not as far as being the GOAT, but just as far as just embodying what Jordan was on the court. He had a lot of Jordan's moves. Like, he really studied the game tapes of Mike. And uh, that's one thing Mike said in an interview where he was just talking about 
the uh, you know, the one on one with different guys, and he's like, yeah, I, you know, I'll probably beat them all, except maybe Kobe because he steals all my moves. Right. You know, so then and it just and that showed again, like you like you said, the amount of respect that MJ had for Kobe, and watching this documentary, he didn't have respect for a lot of his uh, competitors. He he was I definitely did. talking spicy. Yeah, I mean, it was a different era. We we always talk about it. Um, that era was completely different. The mindset of the player was different. Um, but I think Mike just respected the fact that Mike had that killer instinct when he came in the league, and that was after three years of playing college ball. Kobe came in straight out of high school with that mindset. He, you know, again, 18, 19 years old, he's in an all-star game already. You know, people at that point in his career love to mention how he had the four air balls against Utah. And to Kobe, it didn't matter because to Kobe, it was like, all right, and I'll, I would have taken a fifth shot if you would have let me because that's just the type of killer that I am on the basketball court. And to your point, Tripp, I do um, – it, 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 it's very painful to even talk about Kobe just from the standpoint of when it happened. Like I said, I know I was very emotional. Um, you know, we just celebrated his daughter's birthday recently. There was a lot of talk about that. We should have been talking about Kobe going in and what's probably going to be one of the most celebrated Hall of Fame classes ever. Yes. Um, you know, we won't get to see that. So we're robbed of so many moments because Kobe, you know, has left us so soon. Yeah. And, and not only that, too, just to, just to end up on the Kobe point over here, you know, we all look at his playing career and how people, and maybe we could stop with the, the whole comparison now with just LeBron and Michael and Kobe and who's the greatest ever. It, we all have to remember this. It's all opinionated. We all have our uh, – things and ways on who who's the greatest ever who's in the top five this everybody's list is different okay so let and we all have our different opinion, uh, opinions and different feelings on certain players but let's just make one thing and one thing clear here okay whether or not you're going in there and having an argument we're all going to have different opinions on who is the goat at, at, at some point in time all right we all know that who who's the best the best the best is defined differently so in this documentary series alone, we're seeing it on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, where you're seeing all these comments in the sections on who's the greatest ever. It's all opinionated. So at the end of the day, everybody's going to have them. Absolutely. Well said, Will. And I, I agree. Um, not only do I, I hope we just put the GOAT conversation to rest, no matter who you feel is that guy, but I also think we need to start appreciating these guys in a moment. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me the most about this last episode was how hard the media was trying to find a hole in Michael Jordan's persona. You know, whether it was his political views, uh, whether it was the gambling, whether it was who he was associated with. And I think as, as fans, looking back on it, that robbed us of a year and a half of Michael Jordan. I think he may have been more willing to come back in 93 if they weren't so critical of the things he was doing. And then they may even get into it in the future episodes, but I'm, I'm sure we remember it. When his father passed, they tried to link that to the gambling at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, so... It'll, it'll be there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm sure, you know, they'll bring it up, but I want us to enjoy these guys in a moment. And no matter where you have LeBron, I, I have him very high on my list. And I always say it. It's, it's not a knock against him if I have Mike ahead of him. I appreciate LeBron's greatness. And I think sometimes in these debates, people get so blindsided by who they're rooting for that they don't want to respect the other person's greatness. That's so yeah. true. True yeah. words are never spoken right there. And not only that too, but seeing some of these all-stars uh, at that point in time, whether it be with the, with, the, with the Knicks, with the Suns, with the Pacers, you get to see some of these players like, oh my God, I haven't heard some of these names in such a long time. And you really make you appreciate just basketball and, you know, the names in general, just hearing that and the teams in general and what they all went through. So it, it's, just it's we got no basketball right now. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But also too, just with the Knicks, you know, I'm not a Knicks fan, but just to see what they went through year in and year out. And for Michael to actually say that the Knicks were the biggest threat to the three P was just yeah. absolutely unbelievable. Guys, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, they, they, they were because I mean, in the nineties, I mean, there was still we were still in that that era of where you could physically punish your opponents. And you know, one thing that uh, Isaiah was talking about was most of the teams in the Eastern Conference they had that bad boys mentality on the court. They were gonna beat you down every night if you came into the paint. They were gonna make you pay. And it just so happened that the Knicks had 
two of the, the toughest guys in the league on their team at the time with, with Charles Oakley and Anthony Mason. And, and I know we all heard stories about a couple of players, uh, Charles Oakley done slapped, you know, and you didn't, you didn't want no parts of Anthony Mason. Like you wasn't going to say nothing to Anthony Mason. So it, it was tough. And, you know, and then you have, you know, an all time great center and Patrick Ewing, um, you know, I, I think the Knicks were probably, you know, a player away from from even going to the finals that year. If they had a little bit of an upgrade from Starks as the as the number two, and not to take away any, anything from Starks, but you know, I don't think I think Starks was more of a three than a, a, a legitimate number two that could have gotten them over the hump. You know, so they had they had they 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 had a, they had a good uh, a, a good run though. But again, I mean, you're going up against the greatest, so. Even seeing the dream team too is unbelievable. Good. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think um, that Nick team was so tough, um, and they were built in a mode of those bad boy Pistons where they wanted that ruggedness, ruggedness. They wanted that physicality. Um, that was the type of that group of guys. Like if if you played them in a park somewhere, if you beat them on a street ball court, you probably would have had to fight them to get out the park. Like they weren't just going <laughs> to yeah. let you walk out of that park. Um, and, and a lot of times Mike and them almost came to blows with the Knicks for that reason, because the Knicks were trying to fight them as hard as they could. I give mm -hmm. Patrick Ewing a lot of credit. Anthony, you made a great point there. John Starks wasn't, he should not have been the second best player on a team that had title aspirations. Yeah, um, exactly. For years, the Knicks kept trying to find a guard to supplement, um, you know, that role. They, they went and got Derek Harper. They got Doc Rivers. Those guys were old. They got Rolando Black when he was old. They kept trying to find a guy. By the time they were actually able to find their guard in Allen Houston in the late 90s, Patrick Ewing was already old. So they never were able to find that guard that could give Pat the help he needed to get over the top. And with that being said, they battled the Bulls back-to-back -back years in great series. They were finally able to get over the Bulls the following year in 94, and then they run into a really good Rockets team that had Akeem Olajuwon on. Man, it is crazy because one of the guys that I would have loved to see Play for the Knicks at that time was one of the the the, the Knicks' biggest uh, killers, and Reggie Miller. And I tell you, if you had just swapped uh, John Starks for Reggie Miller, the Knicks would would be NBA champions. Yeah, I agree. But we just you know we we just never we never got that. They couldn't get that uh that solid number two for for Pat because everything else you know the role players were were great. Everybody, everybody did their job. You had the, you had the scrappy dudes. The you had your enforcers out there. You know they had they had shooters, and then you had your superstar in the middle. And at that time, you know it was the land of the giants. So you know you got that that all 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 all, all pro center right there in the middle of the paint. And, and Patrick was top five at least uh, center at the time. You know you got to give him his respect for that. Yep. Yeah. You know I think I think they could have did a lot better. And I want to go back just really quick. Eric, to a point that you were making earlier about the media looking for stuff uh, on on Mike, and you had mentioned the uh, the, the gambling, and um, one of the things with the gambling was, you know, what they showed in the doc. Yeah, he went out gambling and came back, and they came back and won the series right after that. Right. So it was it wasn't like a, a Odell situation where you got these guys partying on the boat and then you come back and you lose. Right. And after that, then it's like, all right. I don't care what your vices are. If you come back the next day and you win, you know what? Do what you got to do. Yeah. However, you you know how you need to manage. Lawrence Taylor, he was doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes, but you know what? Giants still still won while while he was there. So you know we all got our vices. We all got you know the things that that we going going through or we need to do to clear our minds, you know, or whatever. But if you can come back from that and 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 still be able to win in a dominating fashion, especially coming from they were down 0-2 to the Knicks. That could yeah. that series could have got ugly. Yeah, he goes to Atlantic City, comes back, they win the series. They That's win it. They that win should they exactly win game after that. And, yeah, so there shouldn't even be a discussion after that. You know what I'm saying? Listen, this is what I do. I like to. It's like me. I might go home. And, and and get a game of 2K in. That might be how I clear my mind. Or you might have a have a little sip or something like that. He liked to go to the casino, you know. And then the other thing with the um the whole, you know, the whole politician thing, I completely understood Mike. His mom wanted him to vouch for a person that he had never met 
never really had a conversation with. I cannot, I don't care, you know what I'm saying? And that's where, where sometimes things get lost in translation where it's like, oh, now it's another brother, so we just got to automatically throw him up there. I don't agree with that. Yeah. I'm not vouching for nobody that I don't know personally. And he still was going to give him a donation to the, you know, to the, to the, um, to the, to the foundation, the campaign, yeah, the campaign, campaign. excuse me, mm-hmm. you know, but it's like, yeah, I can't just go and vouch for somebody that I don't know that that's, that's, that's harmful actually to the, to the people of North Carolina. Me just saying, Oh yeah, go, y'all go and vote for him. And I don't even know what he stands for or n- nothing about his history. Yeah. I, I want to say, I want to get Will's opinion on something that you had just said too in regards to the media, but in regards to Mike's political views, I think that's unfair that we expect every athlete to be this activist. Every athlete isn't brought up that way. And some guys just want to play ball. And I don't think that anybody, not just Michael Jordan, no player should ever be penalized because they don't want to be this outspoken activist. His job is to play basketball. And as long as he's doing that, as long as he's not breaking any laws, we shouldn't hold that against him because he doesn't want to share the same political views as everybody else. Well, also, too, who he even said himself, uh, Sam Smith, he was looking at just like a, a minuscule thing going at it. He didn't even expect it to go top five, being on the New York Times bestseller list. So right then and there alone, when you attach the Jordan rules with Michael Jordan on the cover to really anything, you're basically selling high. You know, at that point. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. So even though he says, oh, you know, I I didn't think it was going to be like this. When you have one of the most popular people in the world at the time, there's always a chance that something like that could happen. There was at at that time, you you could throw Jordan, you could throw Michael Jackson, (laughs) (laughs) Prince, you know, guys like that. Anything that you have that has those guys' names on it, especially things that will make those guys personable to to the to the world and you showing sides to them that we'd never see if we didn't have inside access because in, in reality all we all we're supposed to get is them on the court that's what we're supposed to supposed to, to to see love and joy but we still we love these people we admire these people we hold these people on the pedestal and we don't want to just know what, what's going on in the court we want to know yo does mike does you think mike eat at mcdonald's you think, you know, you think Shaq played 2K? You know what I'm saying? Like, we want to know. We want to be in these people's business. It's just, that's just human nature. We nosy as hell. That's true, too. And also, just to, just to basically almost end up on this, you know, you look at MJ in the uh, 92 Olympics with the way how Tony Kukoc went about his business, everything like that. And MJ basically just covering the American flag over the Reebok uh, symbol right there, just basically showing spite, not spite, but just like, yeah, you know, you don't, you don't want, uh, you don't want me to do this. You know, it's just, it's crazy what happened during that time. And like you said, Anthony and Eric, if this happened during a time of like now, it would have been all blown up out of proportion like crazy. And we would have never heard the end of it. So just crazy you brought, stuff. You brought up the dream team. And uh, one of the things, you know, since these, the last, I guess, four episodes kind of, so the last uh, week, week and a half, the biggest things in that in regards to the dream team now again is the Isaiah Thomas snub mm-hmm. and there's always there's been this mystery and was it Jordan that kept him off the team was it somebody else did he do it to himself right I'm still you know kind of up in the air I know they did show the clip of Jordan when they asked him about the dream team and the first thing that he's well, I don't know if it's the first thing that he said but what they showed was him saying or who all is going to be on the team. So, you know, for, for me, I, I mean, Jordan said he didn't keep him off the team, but if you, if you, if you come into this thing and asking who all is on the team, then that kind of makes me feel like there's somebody that you may not want to be on the team. Two things with that. First thing, Chuck Daly the coach of that team. So you think he would have some sort of power and bringing Isaiah in. And I'm sure Isaiah was on top of Chuck Daly's list. But with the other players that that were involved, you know, usually majority wins in everything. Michael didn't like him as, you know, as a person. Magic didn't like him as a person, even though they did have a little bit of a friendship there. Larry Bird having the the history with Isaiah going to all those playoff battles and even regular season battles, going at it with the Celtics and Pistons. Majority wins. And if you're going to ultimately – cost that, you know, at a chance of winning a gold medal 
you know, you want to have a good time during your off season and not have to deal with this sort of stuff. So, one thousand percent agree. I think it was bigger than Jordan um, not wanting him on. Jordan may have been the biggest voice at the time, but we got to keep in mind. And the doc didn't highlight this, but when Magic was diagnosed with HIV, there were rumors, and and Isaiah Thomas was kind of at the center of these rumors um, that Magic's sexu sexuality is what led to him ultimately contracting the virus. And up until I think three years ago when they did a, a special for NBA TV where they kind of hugged it out and he expressed to Isaiah how he felt about certain some of the comments Isaiah was making at that time. Um, I think that played into it. Um, right. We cannot overlook Isaiah had made some racially insensitive comments about Larry Bird during their playoff series. You know, he's on record as saying, oh, if Larry Bird wasn't white, you guys wouldn't be anointing him as a great basketball player. That's right. And at the time, and this is not to take away from Isaiah's stature in the game, but Bird, Magic, and Mike were the icons of the game. And if you don't get along with those three guys, I mean, it's going to be hard to find anyone who's going to support you and be in your corner. You know, Chuck Daly may have wanted you, but it's like Chuck Daly's one voice is not going to be stronger than Mike's Magic and Bird's. And yeah. I think that's what ultimately doomed Isaiah. I think he had just had bad relationships with some of the most critical and influential guys in the game at the time. We know Isaiah deserved to be on the team. No one could ever debate whether Isaiah should have been there. But when you burn those type of bridges, it's going to be very tough for you to get an invite to something as exclusive as the Dream Team. Yeah, and that's, that's my, my only issue is I, I have an issue with the, the people that try to argue that Stockton should have been picked before Isaiah Thomas, you know, and, and then and, and they argue based off of Stockton's career in comparison to Isaiah Thomas's career. And it's just like, bro, you, the dream team was 92. You got to go by what they had done to that point right. if you're going to compare right. them. It's yeah. not even, yeah, it's not even about the totality of their career because the reason that Christian Leitner made the team over Shaq was because Christian Leitner was coming off a better college career than Shaq. That's yep. right. But if we go off resume, we know, you know, Christian Leitner can't hold his jock strap. We know that. Oh, no, that's a fact. Now we it, do. Now right. we do. Yeah. Exactly. But, 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 in, in, but in college, yeah. In 1992, Christian Leitner, you could, even to this day, if you just want to base off college careers, you can make the argument Christian Leitner has probably had one of the best college basketball careers ever, okay. you know. So in 92, you weren't going to pick Shaq over Christian Leitner as your one college rep. Yeah. But again, it's, it, but let's also not act as if it's disrespectful that Stockton made the team. Stockton's a Hall of Famer. And Stockton had a hell of a career as well. It's just Isaiah was the better player and should have time. gotten a nod. Right. At the time, all time as well. I think all time, you, I would still put Isaiah above him. And yeah. he deserved to be on the team. But it wasn't like they, they snubbed Isaiah for some scrub. John Stockton is, was a hell of a point guard, and he, he still holds a lot of records in the league to this day. He's still one of the best point guards ever played a game. That's a fact. Yeah, and I, know, I don't want to slight John Stockton in this at all because <laughs> right. I, I, rock, I rock with John Stockton. I think he is one of the, the greatest players of all time. Definitely. I, I mean, I got him in my top five point guards uh, of all time, but just at the time, I mean, you're talking about Isaiah Thomas being a back-to-back -back NBA champion, finals MVP, and, you know, Stockton and Malone, they hadn't really scratched the surface just yet of, of their greatness. They were they was good at the time. But, you know, again, this is pre them making it to, to the finals twice. Correct. You know what I'm saying? So they weren't there yet it's just for, you know, for the people that like to argue. Well, he he, he had the – he was the all-time leader in sales and he just assists and blah, blah, blah. Not and at again, that time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Not at that time. Well, also, too, you got to remember this. When the Lakers were going through their, their time of winning their championships in 87-88, uh, one of the teams that made it all the way to the, East, to the Western Conference Finals was that Utah Jazz team. They wound up giving them a, a crazy fight. I, I remember watching videos of that and, you know, just seeing Stockton and Malone just going out there and just doing it. And they had they, – Jerry Sloan was their coach, really good at that point in time. You know, at – uh, Stockton came in in 84, you know, yeah. so he had eight years. He had eight years in the NBA to that point in time. Isaiah had 10, 11, and won two NBA championships. So it's all about situations at, at that point in time as well. So we could go back and talk about what's going on there with, with what happened. But the main thing here is, you know, 
Isaiah got left off. He wasn't liked by his teammates. And, you know, yeah. But I will say this, they, they, need to, they need to get over that beef, him and Jordan. Like, we got to move past it at this point. Yeah, 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 brothers are in y'all 50s now. Like, I got to move on. We we don't we don't seen too much going on in this world for y'all to still be beefing over yeah. something that was 20 years, 30, I'm on, 30 years ago now. Yeah, but I don't I don't blame I don't honestly I don't blame Mike for that. Mike still gave him his respect. He said um he only has Magic Johnson as a better point guard than Isaiah all time. Yeah. He feels, you know, that highly of his game. But I also, I, I get Mike's point of view because we sat there and we heard guys like John Sally and Dennis Rodman and Isaiah openly talk about, we're going to hurt this guy. And we don't care how many times we knock him down. We don't care how hard we foul him. He's going to have to earn it. And when Mike finally earned it, they wouldn't even shake his hand. And I think that's where Mike's, you know, bitterness comes from because it's like, y'all made me earn it and I earned it. I earned it. I didn't cheat anybody out of it. The refs yeah. weren't favoring me. You guys were knocking me around for three straight years, and I, I bit my lip, and I just went with it. And then when I get my moment, you can't even give me the respect to at least shake my hand. Yeah. Now, so I, I agree with you on MJ being upset in the moment and still holding on to that. But people give the, the, the Pistons a lot of flack for doing it. And, and one of the things they spoke about was – the Celtics doing the same thing to them when they got over the hump and they didn't get that type of backlash that the Pistons got. The only thing I will say, cause I was, obviously I was young at the time. So I don't, I didn't remember that series. I had to go back and watch that series. The difference I would say with the Pistons and the Celtics was the Pistons never made it a point to try to beat up on the Celtics the way they try to beat up on Michael Jordan. So their little beef there was kind of like, you know, two teams kind of going at it. It was bad blood. Bird got into a couple fights with Lambeer. You know, they had their own little personal issues. But remember, when they, when they finally got over the hump and beat the Celtics, that was in Detroit. So the Celtics walking off, they could have been, you know, bad sports, but they weren't the home team. When the Pistons did it to the Bulls, the Pistons were the home team. The crowd is giving you the kind of standing ovation. I, I thought, you know, I don't care how many times we look at it. In that moment, you the two-time champions. All right, cool. They may not have viewed it as passing the guard because in their mind, they would have thought, hey, we're coming back. We, we got an opportunity to come back and get these guys again. But I, I still think you shake their hands just because you were the home team and you still show that sign of respect knowing that we try to beat the shit out of these guys. Part of my language. Yeah. And Mike, Mike, he kept competing. <laughs> and I got to respect that. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, I, no, I, I thousand percent agree. I think they were wrong for walking off the court and not and not shaking their hands. But I, it did kind of, oh, did kind of wonder, well, why didn't they get as much flack for doing it when they did it? Because at the end of the day, the reason is the reason. If you did it, you did it. Whatever right. the reason was, you still did but it. But the Celtics, but again, the Celtics never made it personal with the Pistons, where they were physically trying to beat them up. Yeah, well, they didn't have to. They didn't have nobody as good as Mike on the team. No, no, no I mean, but that's, but that's not fair to say either because, I mean, remember early on, um, now, you know, again, revisionist history, but at that time, there was never a player of Isaiah's size who was that good. Yeah. You know, we're talking about a 6'1 point guard who now, here we are later on, we could say guys like, hey, Allen Iverson is that, that good at, at that size. But Isaiah, yeah. again, in the land of the Giants, Isaiah almost beat the Lakers one year with, with, a, with a broken foot. Game six. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying? So Isaiah was the man, and it was just, again, the Celtics relied more on skill as opposed to physicality and being brutes. Yeah, they had yeah. guys like Mikhail, like Paris, like Bird, who all were highly skilled, could pass the ball. When they got added Bill Walton, you know, they had all these guys that, that were very high basketball IQ guys. The Pistons wanted to make it rugged, and that's cool. I get that. But yeah. at some point, too, you try to beat a guy up, and he could beat you at your own game. You got to tip your hat to him, be like, "All right, you got that one." No, that's yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Now, Eric, I got it. I got it. Oh, no, no, I want to get Will's point okay, on. Okay, go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, to get back to your point with the John Sally and the uh, Dennis Rodman point, it's amazing how they wound up becoming teammates for a little bit in Chicago as well uh, down the stretch. I know Dennis Rodman is obviously well known for that being a teammate there, but John Sally as well, just going over to Chicago for for a couple of years and doing that. Uh, Pretty amazing. And as far as, you know, what you guys are talking about, you know, you look at the, the Pistons at that point in time, you know, 
you talked about uh, Isaiah Thomas, who's being a 6'1 guard in the land of the Giants at that point in time. Michael Jordan being 6'6 with the crazy athleticism that he had and the, the work ethic and the desire that he had to want to be great. Uh, you know, the Pistons really are like, you know what, hey, don't let this guy fly in the air and get the crowd into it because once the crowd gets into it, remember, the, the crowd feeds off the player's energy and what goes on. So I get where the Pistons were coming from, and I get where Chuck Daly and all the players were coming from, from that perspective. You know, you don't want to get the, the home team, you don't want to get the Chicago Stadium crowd all pumped up for whatever reason it is, and it becomes such a, a sixth, a, literally a sixth, seventh man at that point in time. You know, so you don't want to, you don't want any part of that. I totally understand that 100%. And not only that too, but you want to, you don't want to have Jordan beat you at that point in time. You want to have yeah, his teammates definitely. go out there and, and beat him in, in that perspective. But as far as the walking off the court goes, listen, they, they wound up just doing it. And to me, was it a big deal? But yeah, you know, people are going to make a big deal over it. I was, I wasn't even a, I was still in my mother's womb when that series <laughs> happened, you know, so we'll, we'll just put it like that. But just looking at it then, and that happened when, 91? That was 91. Yes. Okay, so I was out of my mother's womb at that point in time. <laughs> you know, I was, couldn't even talk yet. But that's the point. The point is, is that, you know, we'll, we'll look, like you said, our revisionist history, everything like that. It, it is what it is. They walked off the court after... You know, they went through all those series back in the late late uh, 80s, going into 1990 at that point in time when they had Doug Collins still as their coach mm -hmm. in Chicago. So, again, realistically, like, they did it. Could they have been good sportsmanship? It is what it is. But that's what made Detroit Detroit right. in everybody's eyes. You know, the bad boys in that yeah. sense. Yeah? We, that was, we that don't was want, we don't want right any there, part yeah. of that. We don't want any part of that. Boom out the door sportsmanship what's that all about with bad right. boys you know that's, next that's so. a fact yeah, absolutely right now eric i gotta go back to you because another uh point that you know we got to on the documentary was charles oakley putting the blame on patrick ewan for them losing that series where mike went to atlantic city gambling as the nick fan on the show what do you got to say to that I think it's completely unfair. And I, I hold Charles Oakley in high regard. Um, you know, we've spoken about Charles, not only his presence on the team, but obviously some of the nonsense that's happened afterwards, you know, with him and Dolan. And I respect Charles Oakley. I really do. Um, but in this case, I think it's unfair and he's wrong. Patrick Ewing, as we talked about earlier, Patrick Ewing for a lot of years never had that quote unquote second guy, that Robin. Um, John Starks was an undrafted free agent and we got the most that we could get out of John Starks, but at no point did anyone ever expect John Starks to be the number two guy. And when I heard the comments and, and read them, I should say, and then as we started talking about it, I look back that series that he's talking about, Patrick Hewen averaged 26 points and 10 rebounds. Patrick Hewen gave us everything he had. He didn't stink up the joint. He went toe to toe with the bulls. And he was taking on not only what most consider the greatest player of all time, but also probably one of the top 20 players of all time in Scottie Pippen. And Pat had to go in there again. He had, he had bruisers. He had Oakley. He had Mason. He had, you know, Doc Rivers was on that team. Greg Anthony was very young. John Starks was feisty, and everybody remembers the dunk. But who else on that team could Patrick Ewan rely on to get them through the dry spells of the offense? Who else in that team could Patrick say, hey, look, if, you, if they double me, this guy's going to be open and that guy can take over for, for a short amount of time. There was nobody else on that team that could do that. And to blame him for 93 specifically, I think is wrong. Now, if you want to say Pat could have played better in 94 when they lost in the finals against Olajuwon, all right, you could probably make that case. They lost in game seven. If you want to say, hey, Pat shouldn't have missed that finger roll in 95 against the Pacers, hey, I, I, I'm with you. But you cannot blame 93 on Pat. As you mentioned that, we were up 2-0 in that series. Patrick averaged 26 points, 10 rebounds. Who else on that team was getting buckets? That's what I want to know. Who else is a guy that when they started doubling Pat after game two, that they said, hey, look, this guy can get us maybe 15 to 20 tonight and carry us while they focus on Pat. 
Yeah, and that that's my only issue. If he if he had said this after they lost, I, I probably wouldn't feel the way I, I feel about it now. But just the fact that I mean, now this is the first time I'm ever hearing of him blaming it on Pat, and we're talking about you know again almost thirty years ago, and now you you know you want to throw him under the bus. Now I I just for the people that may not know what he exactly is the reason why he's blamed it on Patrick. Let me just say so basically what Oakley was saying that there was a lot of times where they would just double team Patrick Ewing and he would try to just shoot over the double team as a as opposed to passing. But then again to your point, Eric, if I'm passing the ball out of the double team, is somebody gonna be there that I'm confident in that can make that shot? And that's the key. I mean, again, we when I when I think back at those teams, I think about how hard they played, but I also think about how many times in close games we had no one else who could get us a basket or could deliver, right? For every other player's greatness and every other championship team, there's always a guy or two who can make a play, who can make a shot whenever the star player gets double and sometimes triple team. If you look back at the footage of those 93 Knicks, Patrick Hewen has taken tough fadeaway jumpers, tough baseline jumpers, because he's getting double teamed and pushed off of the block to the point where it's like, we're not even going to let you go one-on-one against Cartwright or Winnington. or you know you'll abuse them. Right, because you, you'll take advantage <laughs> of those guys. Your, skills, your skill level is too high. So we're going to push you out, and now you're taking these 16, 17 footers from the baseline, as Anthony said, over double teams, because who am I giving the ball to? Who, who else? And that, that's my point. Who else on that team could honestly say, hey, look, I was stepping up and I was giving us everything we had. The, the highlights they showed the other night is a perfect example. Game five, the series is, is tied at two, right? They doubling down on Pat. We get the ball somehow to Charles Smith. And what happens? <laughs> he gets blocked four times, point blank range. Yeah. We never get another shot. You know what I'm saying? Uh, game six in, in 94 against Houston, as good of a game that, that John Starks had, they double the entry to Patrick Ewan, and anybody can look back and see. And we're left with a John Starks three from the corner that could have won us the championship. And what happens? It gets blocked. So, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Pat needed that guy. By the time we got that guy, Pat was a little too old. Starks barely made the team, just as, as a matter of fact. Oh, a lot of people don't you know, know that story. Yeah, shout, a lot shout of people to, don't know. Shout out to John Starks, and you definitely, you guys, you got to go back into the archives, and you guys can watch the uh, yeah. Real Fans Real Talk interview with John Starks, where he talks about him almost not even making a scene had it the team had it not been for him getting injured. That yeah. was the only thing that actually kept him on the yeah. team was the injury. So you guys definitely need to hit up the archives and uh, check that uh, John Starks interview where he talks about it. But to, to go from somebody to not even being on the team to now this is the second best guy. I mean, it's great if you're playing on that level, but we know Starks wasn't on that level of the top guys. And the, the teams that were winning, they had a they had that that one-two punch. Listen, you know, The Bulls Starks. had Jordan and Pippen. Right. The Celtics had Mikhail and Bird. The Lakers had Magic, Worthy, and Kareem. You know, the Pistons, they – they just had the whole whole bunch of they 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 kind of been the same as the as the Chauncey uh, yeah. the Wallace Pistons where it was kind yeah. of spread out. But you gotta have multiple guys, and the Knicks just didn't have that. Yeah, even if you look at the teams that Mike, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just want to make this you one quick it. point. Don't worry. Even if you look at the teams that Mike was playing in the finals, all those teams have multiple guys, and so the fact that the Knicks were even battling with them shows you how tough they were playing and how good Patrick was. That it was like we don't have the second guy, but Patrick can at least keep us in the game. Just to reiterate with the whole Charles Oakley thing for a second here, you know, Eric, you're 100% right, you know, on on him not having, Ewing not having the second go-to guy to go to during that point in time. But just from Charles Oakley's perspective here, right, when you look at, you know, the best teams at that, at that point in time, and Oakley did play for the Bulls for a little bit, and he played with them, Jay, and he saw it. He got to see it on both, both ends. It wasn't until Phil came into the picture and just basically said, hey, you got to trust your teammates to Mike at that point in time. You know, with Pat, and he had Pat Riley there too as, as, the, as the coach, you know, you got to look at it and you got to just say to yourself like, okay, you know, he's, he's shooting the double teams, everything like that. But there are guys open at that point in time. Did it, I don't know, maybe in, that, in, his, in his mindset, I, I don't know. 
did it ever come down to him where it was just like, you know, I'm the star, you know, everything like that. Or, you know, just go out there. You got to you gotta trust your teammates. And, you know, it didn't happen like that. Well, nobody was a great scorer outside of Pat on that That's team. That's true. No, That's it's true. Thing. It's true. 100%. Mike, Mike had guys that could actually score the basketball. So even, all right, so even if you got Mike and Scotty, right, but then the Bulls had great shooters along the way. Paxson was a great shooter. Curran and Kukoc were shooters. Right. So they had guys that could make the shot. Patrick just didn't have that. Yeah. And 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 to the point, you know, we talk about, you know, a great scorer and, and guys you can trust. The difference with Mike was because Mike was a guard, Mike could say, give me the ball and just move out the way. That's true. Patrick, as a big man, needed a guard to get him the ball. Yes. So, you know, if Doc Rivers is taking his time getting across half court and we don't get into our offense and set fast enough, guess what? Now I got to live with somebody else taking a quick shot because I didn't get a chance to post up, you know, or as we yep. talked about, I might, he may get the ball and kick it back out to kind of release the double team. But if you don't give it back to me, I can't go to work now. Yep. I kind of, I got to hope that you guys can do the right thing. So I, we, we give Pat a lot of slack, man. And I remember being a young guy reading the newspaper, like sometimes even influenced thinking like, Oh, the paper saying is true, but it wasn't. Pat carried us a lot of times when we didn't have a guy. John Stars gave us as much as he could. And I, I, I definitely commend him for the career he had coming from being an undrafted rookie. But find me the guy that on those teams was good enough to be a true number two scorer. And then we could say, oh, Pat didn't do enough. Because until then, it was a one-man gang. We had all this great physicality. We had a great coach. But we never had another guy who could complement what Pat could do. Yeah, that's why I say if you had thrown if man if you had thrown Reggie in there, the Knicks could have possibly three peated if it's Reggie yeah. with Pat in his prime. You know you what I'm know? saying? Or even you look at some of them situations, like I said, with the West, you know, Barkley not only had Kevin Johnson, who a lot of people don't realize Kevin Johnson was one of the premier point guards during that that's time. Right. Dan mm -hmm. Marley was a very good player on those teams. You know what I'm saying? Great shooter. Right. <laughs> Magic, Magic, when he played Magic in the finals, Magic still had worthy. He still have Lottie Divox. You know what I'm saying? Like they, these were teams that were built, as we all talked about, with not just one main guy, but a good supporting cast. The Knicks just didn't have that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, definitely. Listen, at the end of the day, this is a great docu series. Um, you know, it's the only thing we got right now in sports. However, this has got to be the year of the documentary <laughs> because <laughs> we just got uh, two two new documentaries were announced and a third one is being called to, 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 to be made. Um, but you got, a you got, you got Clay Thompson who's putting out a documentary on his uh, ACL injury and recovery. You got the Clippers are putting out um, uh, a documentary on the whole Donald Sterling, you know, racist comments or whatever, his phone conversation, whatever. And then you got Robert Ory, who's tweeting out that he needs to have a documentary because he got seven rings and we shouldn't forget about him. <laughs> One of the greatest role players to ever do it in Robert Ory, seven rings with three different, uh, three different teams. Make no mistake about it, great career for him. But just to start off here with the Clippers for a second, you know, you look at what happened back in, what was it, 2013-14 before uh, Donald Sterling got basically banned for life by uh, Adam Silver. And you look at what happened, and you look at the Clippers as as a franchise as a whole uh, at that point in time. Remember, they were laughing stock before before Chris Paul got there. They were the laughing stock of the league, only making it to the playoffs once in the two thousands in 05, in the oh five oh six year with Elton Brand and company, with Sam Cassell there as well. And you know, you look at everything that that happened, and that team had so much promise in 13-14, right? With Blake Griffin and Chris Paul, DeAndre Jordan, J.J. Redick being there. And, you know, you just see it. And they wound up getting Doc Rivers as, as their coach. And Del Negro was their coach prior to that. And everything that happened was just, it was just like, it was shocking because you never would actually see that from an owner. But a couple of years back when Baron Davis was on that team, he basically came out, Donald Sterling, and called him fat. What are you doing? You know, you got to play more. I'm paying you all this money. Go out there and you got to do it. And it, it just made you wonder in that, not only in that market that they played in in Los Angeles and being second fiddle to the Lakers at that point in time, but to go, to go five years later and then you hear the comments 
to me, that wasn't shocking. And it's a, it, it, it makes out to be a good documentary. Uh, yeah. Make no mistake about it. But again, you know, everybody's going to want to look for a documentary and it, it, it's, it's mind blowing that you get a, an owner's that that's banned. And then Steve Ballmer comes in, buys the team from, from the league at that point in time. And then they wound up doing a complete 180. So yeah. that's just pretty amazing in itself right there. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see that one a little more than the clay documentary. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if, if you're telling me it's, it's footage of, of one year of you trying to recover, uh, I'm okay on that. We, we've kind of seen that story before. Uh, but Donald Sterling, I am because, um, as, as Will mentioned, the comments towards players, relationship within the league, um, him being a slumlord and all the lawsuits against him. Like, all, those are all things I, I want to kind of see. Um, and, you know, as a fan of, this, of the sport of basketball, I hope it does not portray the league in a bad way. But I'm almost fearful because I don't think he's the only owner that had the same thoughts and opinions that he kind of discussed. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the only thing I would be a little fearful of. Like, I, I hope it's not one of those things that's like, yeah, I was a bad guy, but there were 10 other bad owners with me. And then that right. was like, you know, you well, is, is, cause I, cause that's what I, I'm, I'm not sure. Do they have Donald Sterling speaking on the documentary as far as an interview after the time, or are they just going to be talking about it and having other people speak on it? I would assume, um, yeah, I, I don't know for sure, but I would assume that Donald Sterling isn't a part of this doc because I, I just can't imagine him willing to sit there and allow the slander on his name. Yeah. I would assume this is a, a you know an outside party who probably has some of this public information and is putting this all together. And they're gonna wrap it around kind of like you said that 2014 season where everything kind of fell apart for him. Yeah. So, you know, but I, I hope that we don't get Donald Sterling or Donald Sterling's people trying to say, well, yeah, you know, this is who he was, but guess what? There are 10 other owners within the league that kind of share these opinions and views because I don't want it to tarnish the league. And I, that's just speaking from a fan standpoint. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I would assume, you know, again, I could be wrong, but I would assume that it doesn't just because they're advertising this during the last dance time. True. So that's I'm going gonna, gonna to assume that it doesn't do that. <laughs> I hope it doesn't do that. Um, but I, again, I am very interested to see it. I mean, again, we're talking about uh, five, six years ago, and I still really would like to see this one. Clay is not a big enough personality for me to want to see him recover from an injury. I really don't want to see anybody recovering from injury in a documentary, but Clay is not, you know what I'm saying? Like if it was MJ recovering or LeBron or Kobe, somebody like that, maybe I might turn it on, but I'm not really interested in seeing guys recover from injury. Like it's just, it's not yeah. something I, I really want to see. Now Listen, we don't you, need a doc for that. We, you can just yeah. post that on your Instagram. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, I know you always, you always quick on your feet. What would you title the Robert Ory documentary? Uh, it would either have to be, it would either have to be Mr. Big Shot, or well, that's Chauncey Billups, though. Yeah, it's that's or, Chauncey. Or, or, I mean, it, it. I think Robert Ory's hit more big shots than, than Chauncey, but but that was um, his nickname, though. So all right, so yeah, that right. was his nickname. Um, it it'll be called Right Place, Right Time. <laughs> okay, I like that one. <laughs> I I would I would call I would call his seventh heaven for his seventh right for his seven rings just because okay. that as well. You know, but to to get to the Clay documentary here for a second, uh, you know, Steve Nash when he was playing with the Lakers had had a documentary as well, and that was on YouTube. That was by Bill Simmons. So if you put that on YouTube, and you have your own work, and you know if it's Bill Simmons that's doing it, great. But outside of that, if you're looking for like you know an independent like something to go in the movie theater for it uh no thanks i'm not i really want no part of that yeah. and not only and you know can you imagine if donald sterling were to be on that documentary you know that would be like saying john spano and it actually did happen john spano was you know getting interviewed by uh by by espn for for and being for 30, a, yep. a part of the big shot for the 30 for 30 with the islanders yeah. so you know so just now that's abs absolutely unbelievable so, so Will, to your point, right? So if we do get a Clay documentary, <laughs> let's say, are we getting 10 hours of a Clay documentary <laughs> similar to The Last Dance? Uh, uh, I, I, would, I would honestly, if this is going to be a documentary here, because the way how Bill Simmons did it with his, 
with Steve Nash back in 2014, 15, chronicling Steve Nash's time trying to get back on the court with his back injury. Mm -hmm. You know, go a half hour, <laughs> half hour to 45 minutes instead of doing it. 30 for a 30. Ten, it, no, Thir no, no, 30 for 30. 30 for 30 shorts. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Dude, just... No, I mean 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes. Yeah. Just a 30-minute documentary and then just clip it up and find the right pieces for, for it and, you know, chronicle it and try and put it put it in the right frame of mind for the person to, to watch it instead of like a, a three-part documentary series. We know how great Clay Thompson is and he's still in the prime of his career. Yeah. You know, it's not like Steve Nash coming back at age 35, 36 with career back end uh, injuries, trying to go out there on the beach, waking up early in the morning, riding <laughs> skateboard, everything like that. So it's yeah. just totally different, you know. And so it, basically, I would say a half hour, 45 minutes. I think it's too, it's, too, it's too early. It's either too early or too late to put out this type of documentary if it's Clay Thompson. Because if this was something where – Let's say this happened, the injuries happened before they won the three championships. And then he comes back from the injury and they win three championships. Then I'm a little bit more intrigued to watch it. But the fact that they already got the chips and then it's like, all right, you got hurt after and now you're trying to come back. It's, you know, like, okay, great. You made it back to the league. Everybody, right. a lot of guys get injured and come back. Yeah, I, I'm not, with the clay thing, I'm a little fearful of that too because if, if we get this documentary, let's say three years from now, and the Warriors have uh, yet to get back to their place um, where we previously saw them, uh, then it's going to be who cares? Like you guys yeah. went to five chips, you, uh, you went to five finals, you won three chips, you got injured. We know the story already, you know. But if they get back to that elite status, then I might be a little more intrigued to kind of see the thoughts that went into it. Again, we can't let a show go by without saying thank you to our sponsors. Uh, Petro Home Services, Kmart, the Rosado Firm, Soundview Liquors, uh, you know, those those uh, companies, they have been holding us down for the past couple of years, making sure that every charity event that we put on goes off without a hitch. Um, and again, you know, just a reminder, guys, we have not forgot about you. We know we're going to be back at the Barclays Center, but as you guys know, everything is shut down right now, but we will be back at the Barclays Center uh, for the finals. Um, you know, for the 2K tournament, once things open back up, we'll have a better idea of when we can can uh, schedule a new date. But again, we have to thank our sponsors. Big shout out to Petro Home Services, Kmart, the Rosado Firm, and uh, and, and, and Soundview Liquors. Um, with that being said, really quick, since I was just talking about the charity event, the, uh, the NBA 2K League actually um, started today. Um, you guys can go back with the, the OG King Kurt interview is up right now on on realfansrealtalk.com if you missed it it's a, it's a two-part interview um but the next uh gaming crew will be in action very soon so you know y'all ain't got nothing else y'all better be watching the 2k league it's the only game in town right now <laughs> and, and it's live you know what i'm and saying we don't know who's gonna win it <laughs> so <laughs> definitely you guys should definitely check out the uh the, the 2k league um, UFC 251 has been postponed indefinitely. Obviously, we, you know, we spoke a couple of weeks ago. Um, they were trying to actually make this thing happen. And that was for three weeks ago when they were still trying to make it happen when we were really in the belly of the beast. Right. So, you know, now they've, they've said, it, said it's postponed indefinitely, which is the right thing to do. Um, again, we'll, we'll update you guys more on that once we have uh, the information. And we're going to end this one off really quick. Um, with a moment of silence, uh, we lost a football legend, uh, Miami Dolphin uh, legend, you know, as far as in, in, in the upper brass, Don Shula. So really quick, we're just going to take a quick moment of silence for the, for the Miami Dolphin legend. All right, rest in peace again. To, to, to Don Shula, and again, condolences to family, friends, fans, you know, everybody, everybody that, 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 you know, he made a, a impact on their lives, you know, condolences, and um, we're going, again, we're going to end this up, I ain't going, I don't want to end up on a negative note, so on a positive note, we got a whole lot of virtual tennis going on right now, we got all of the big time, uh, both past and present tennis superstars coming out to play Mario Tennis and virtual tennis, uh, you had the Williams sisters. You had my main man, 
Johnny McEnroe out there. You got you got Federer. You got all these guys playing uh, virtual tennis and for a good cause, raising money for uh, COVID-19 relief. If you guys get a chance, definitely check it out. You know, all, all of the kids do it. The kids, the kids watch people playing video games all day. Right. So <laughs> you might as well too. We in quarantine. Here we go. Right. We've, been, we've been criticizing the kids for all these years. Now we watching virtual basketball and virtual. <laughs> exactly. I still don't understand how people are watching all the people play video games. That's just amazing. It really is. Yeah, it's mind boggling to me. I, I it really is. I want to play the game. I don't. I don't want to watch. I want to right? play myself. Right. I mean, but we're here making content. That's really the main, the more important thing. You know, we're here making content right now, just doing that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So listen, guys, for you guys at home, uh, for myself, Trip Young, Legend of Two Games, and of course, Will Carucci on the board sports. We will see you guys next week, man. We up out of here. Take care, guys. Thank you for having me. Peace out. Uh-huh. This is real fans, real talk, talk. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. Reporting live from the cam, high in demand. So please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot. So put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie. Eric Sanchez, you heard what I said, we elite Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets it's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9 For the older folks, so even if you younger No matter what sport, this show, we got it covered It's filmed live, in the middle of BK So ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought